Welcome back to Champion Spring, and it will be Stitch. Ohana means pentakill, Papa Smithy. He gets it in his first game back in Korea, coming from Midnight Sun in the LMS. First champion's pentakiller of the season. I believe he wins a PC from that, right? Yep. From memory, and honestly, he just built like a tank and still did a lot of damage, and that's the reality we live in when Trundle is in the meta. Yeah, true enough. But this little team fight positioning here was quite good. And you see how many people he ends up autoing with the hurricane in the brush, but really itemizing very intelligently. You, you have to hand it to him. That was one of the big factors in the win was Stitch going into from Ma into Sterix Gage and then Banshee's Veil in this game. Unorthodox, but under these circumstances, extremely effective. In a game where the opposing team had a burst threat that could potentially kill him if he didn't go a defensive build, and only one other consistent damage kill outputter, it's that scenario where you just want to stay alive, and eventually the Ren damage would just be the factor as we get a cool camera angle for this kill, and it's not Stitch not doing a lot of damage. Don't, like, take it out of context. Each one of these orders is doing maybe half a bar of the tank's health, but he's staying alive, and... That's all that needed to happen. That is all that needed to happen this game. And the chase down here with the Ren for the Pentakill. And the champion's dying in first person looks hilarious. <laughs> LeBlanc just kind of fell backwards in and, woe. And there he is. You know, we wonder why play this guy. Core JJ had a very good outing in Samsung's last match, picked up an MVP of his own. But Stitch is like, I'm the man now. Coming in, gets and, his Penna. And of course, Stitch and. Both Stitch and Core JJ come from that same Xenix team, you know, the Xenix factory that's provided so <laughs> many great names across the the world in terms of top Korean talent, so they know each other very well. It's going to be a lot of friendly rivalry and banter between these two ADs, because now, suddenly, the starting position's completely up for grabs. Yeah. Indeed, Ambition looked thrilled right there to have won that comeback game. Does Ambition ever look thrilled? No. He looks <laughs> angry all the time. <laughs> So let's get into game number two. Africa needs to push that advantage harder than they did. They certainly did a nice job of snowballing the early game before they ran out of gas and made some crucial errors that gave Samsung the opening to make some plays. And guess what? It's going to be ZTF and Thresh Band again. And this is what every team, I think, is going to do until Africa shows that they can win games without those champions. And we can talk about misplays and misfires in the game. You know, cru crucially, it was Crown in terms of his lane mechanics. And then later in the game, it was just uh, Mickey getting overzealous, trying to pick up kills. But I think a lot of the issues actually came from the draft. It felt like... Uh, the flex picks were picked up by Samsung, you know, at some point it didn't look like Crown would actually be able to pick up Lissandra, but could eventually play it by the end. And the draft in general was lopsided in in Samsung's favor when it came to those late game team fights. If they couldn't take the win early enough, if you're going to opt into three tanks, they will be shred by the Trundle ult, and they will fall down and be served on the silver platter for Stitch to take them down. So I need to see different drafting, specifically on the red side, if you can just emulate Ever and go for those flex picks of your own, Africa can do something different just from the picks and bans. Well, contemplating a possible Thresh ban here to round out the draft. Samsung taking a lot of time. They're going to ban LeBlanc, interestingly enough, even though they handled it pretty expertly. But with the Lissandra ban, maybe they feel like they don't have a good answer to Mickey's LeBlanc any longer. But that will open up a Thresh for Snowflower. Lots of powerful picks available. Zed, Twisted Fate, LeBlanc, all edge bands, so a lot of the strong meta champions are available. Rise is off the pool, though, and that means a Callista first pick once again. And we're not even sure if we're going to see Tank Callista, but could be. Could be. Mickey now uh, down to really Ari from his assassin pool if he wants to run that champion. Otherwise, for the first time this season, we may see him on a more traditional mage like Victor. Could see the Victor come through, but that would kind of require the carry pants to come from somewhere else. And didn't look like anyone was bounding forward to be a carry threat from Afrika based on that previous game. Yeah, Song Yoon couldn't make it work on the Lucian, and Ixu wasn't given a pick. So will they just first pick the Victor Alistair now? Deny that from Crown. Crown has had some good uh, Victor games to start off this season. Yeah, it's a definitely a, a comfort pick for Crown and a pick that. 
it's Mickey's basically forced into with three bands. It's not an insult to say that his champion pool was largely shredded. Target ban from Samsung. He's going to go for the comfortable Victor. It was one of those scenarios where if they didn't pick up Victor, Crown would have taken it, and it felt like Mickey only had the RE to opt into that matchup and didn't want to do that. So Rek'Sai Thresh may be selected right now. Samsung saving their solo lanes now that even though they see that Victor or the last round of the draft and Snowflower preferring to take that Alistair even when he has the Thresh available and unbanned. So prioritizing more along the lines of the power picks in this meta rather than the pocket pick offered by Thresh. Well, that will be the lane matchup there. So close to Thresh, obviously very powerful combination and a very big threat in the laning phase. I don't think we're in a scenario where Freaky can afford to blind pick their top lane again. I think Cuvee starting to show his chops in terms of size of champion pool and ability to carry. It was specifically the Sandra a couple of days ago, but the Olaf pick showed a larger champion pool and was super effective as a last rotation pick for, for Samsung in the previous round. So need to see something from Iksu, and it's good to see that they're going to be keeping away and giving him that counter pick. But does Iksu have the champion pool to actually justify a red side last pick? That's going to be the question. You can see the Elise will be locked in and Misfortune falling all the way through the draft after some teams we've seen even SK Telecom prioritizing it as a blue side first pick. Now will be taken by Sanyun. So they've got an AOE damage composition. They're doing something very different than last game. And realistically, the first three drafts from Samsung aren't going to interrupt bullet time. Obviously, there's a scenario where somehow Ambition gets a flank, but realistically, he's going to be a frontliner. They don't have the Alistair. They don't even have the Trundle unless they want to go for a top lane Trundle at this point. So they may have to go for carry threats of their own and kite backwards because for now, it looks like the space control from Misfortune is going to be largely undeniable. Yeah, and we'll see what exactly Kube decides to take. Remember, Fiora is available right now, and that's going to be a Cassiopeia locked in for Stitch and the Olaf. This is a very interesting draft from Samsung. We haven't seen Cassiopeia yet in Korea this season. And against champions like MF and Victor, who have so much zone control, how close you have to get on Cassiopeia might become an issue. And again, kiting backwards suddenly is their only option. Engaging with Cassiopeia is super hard. You want to ult flash in some ways to cancel that animation. It's not very realistic, certainly not reliable. Kiting backwards and standing next to your hyper carry is viable, and funnily enough, the only time we've seen a Cassiopeia blind pick in recent memory was, of course, Jensen picking it up for Cloud9 during IEM. Decent on that option, but such a strange champion to pick. I guess it's not a blind pick, though. It's against the big team. Yeah. Uh, still, though, uh, questionable with the amount of zone control that they have. Uh, Crown is going to have to play very well in these team fights if he wants to do any damage at all. Meanwhile, the Olaf, pretty standard in this meta as a blind pick. Interestingly, Iksu is going to opt into the Maokai Olaf matchup, which is interesting considering that that was intentionally chosen by Kuve in the last game. And the reason why I don't like this in this scenario, because the laning phase was fine, you saw. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, the team fights were where the big issue came. If Iksu was picking it up to target specifically the Cassiopeia, I think it's a smart choice. Cassio is fairly that lacks a lot of maneuverability, can be caught out in a team fight, but the rest of his lineup doesn't really function as a dive lineup. They're more peeling backwards for Misfortune. They want to fight in bullet time. So because we're going to expect Maokai to dive in and then the rest of the team to play in Misfortune's bullet time, I feel like there's a bit of scattered priorities for Afrika. Yeah, they still have some nice peel, though, with the Maokai. It's always an option to play that way. In any case, we'll see what they can do, if they can make up for the last game they certainly have gone for a different style of play. Still only those two threats from the carry position, but much more AOE and teamfight presence, that's for sure. And our first Cassiopeia of the season will be taken by Crown. And can he synergize with Kuve and Stitch once again, who are reprising their roles on Olaf and Kalista from the last game? Let's find out. Game two, Samsung versus the Freaks.
Samsung slithering their way out of the base with their Cassiopeia. Africa on the red side, moving down, everyone fanning out as they hit the river. So it looks like no planned invades here. Well, it's a surprise Cassiopeia lock. It's certainly a Cassiopeia victor matchup. We saw plenty of times through the course of 2015, it's a matchup where specifically if Victor gets a big advantage, we've seen Faker, for example, taking in the outer mid lane turret and then roaming all over the map as Cassio takes a lot longer to clear waves than Victor with his line wave clear. So I feel like this lane can really snowball to Victor's favor, but Cassio does always have all in potential from his earliest level two. Massive single target damage from Cassiopeia. Yeah. Song Yoon will recall and then head into the top side. So attempt at a lane swap here from the Africa Freaks, and they will not get it this time as the lane swap comes right back around. We see Stitch and Wraith heading into that top side, so they will get the Olaf Maokai matchup again. I have to wonder how much of these lane swap shenanigans or lane swaps being called or attempted are based on information or just based on previous priority, just because there's just not that same deep vision to really make the same informed judgments you could in previous matches. Well, even with the deep vision, a lot of it was pretty easy to play around, sure. show yourself on a ward, fool the opponent. So it's always been a bit coin flippy. But this time, we will see uh, Kuve heading into lane and getting some of that experience. He has not shown himself yet, so passively gaining XP off of that wave, Ixu shows up. A little bit of damage on him, and as soon as he is seen, they will move into lane. So they're not going to get Ixu's teleport right off the bat like they did in the last game. Seeing some trades in the top lane. Sun Yun's much lower in health. Actually, he's already used his biscuit Ooh. as well, so actually in a very big hole in terms of trading stats. And yeah, may have taken a play early. So Crown and Mickey doing a little bit of damage trading. Crown coming out pretty well for the initial trades. And Wraith now going to be checking that red buff. He's going to find Lyra, but on the back side of the smite. So no attempt at harassment when as Lyra hits level three. When it comes to this mid lane matchup, Crown will have the advantage early. It actually only starts to swing when the first hex core upgrade comes through from Mickey. You can see the trade. Single target damage has always been something that Cassiopeia is very strong at. It's when Victor gets that instant backline clear, level seven, with his first hex core upgrade, the Cassio can't match the wave here. But previous to then, if you ever confirm that poison, the Twin Fang all ins, there's actually very high kill potential from a Cassio on Victor early. Yeah, and the Thunderlords too, making that even more likely these days. Ah, uh, yes, more damage. <laughs> League of Thunderlords is still going to be around for a while. I'm really looking forward to 6.1 Varus with the Storm Raider Surge, meaning that he's going to be just bounding all over the map when he's channeling his Q. Might be a possibility, a possible mid lane pick once again. So Lyra now coming through into Tribrush. Kuve will find him there, eat a cocoon and a spider. Thunderlord's proc as well. <laughs> Very nice. A bit of bonus damage. Ambition responds by going for some counter jungling in the top side of the map as Wraith and Stitch inch their way towards the enemy turret. The evolving question this game is how will Crown do in mid to late game team fights? You have to feel like Ixu diving in on him will have a spirit visage and magic resist at some point. Crown needs to find an item build and a snowball that lets him kill the, di the diving frontline on him because otherwise, both Mickey and Samyun should be positioned well out of his damage output range in a fight. Kidoki, wave coming back down and we do see Ambition heading down into the bottom side just to protect this Olaf and start to clear out some of these wards. Olaf unharassed so far in the lane and moving closer to that level six. So I'm surprised Mickey is going for the Frost Queen's claim build first after taking so much harass damage early, but Crown, of course, building into that tier, so not a lot of combat stats. Look, he obviously needs to get his Hex Core upgrade, but backed without enough gold to do so, so it's the only thing he can really build into. Abyssal Scepter will sound like it'll be necessary, but honestly, Victor wants to stay out of damage trade range rather than look for an Abyssal Scepter for any sort of trades of his own. Tough spot, but he's staying back. He hasn't fallen too far behind. 
when it comes to CS. Chased off a few minions, but that's about it. Stitch now having a fun time playing against the most interactive ability of all, E Max Misfortune. <laughs> you love it, don't you? Aren't you looking forward to 6 1 when they nerf it? It's just so silly. It's silly that you sit there and you can't do anything about it because you have to kite backwards. Because if you kite forwards, the support comes along and trades with you while you're taking a Thunderlord's proc and up to 310 base damage. The, it, the thing about the change, I mean, people look at the slow. It's not the slow, it's the range of the ability. It's suddenly now out of trade range of basically everything except Lucian getting a Q through minions and an Ezreal Q. So in almost every scenario, you're winning trades instantly with Make It Rain Maximus Fortune. Yeah, it does give you a nice opportunity to, to follow up. And her passive, since they changed it, no slouch when it comes to those trades in lane either. That's the fun thing. When Q Maximus Fortune returns after the changes, people are going to be like, wait, these Qs, if they go through a minion, they're doing four, yeah. four 500 damage. And with the priority given to those Qs too off of her new passive, it, she gets a, uh, an auto off on you, and it you are so taking a damage. crazy amount of damage. She'll be forced out of being first pick, first rotation, or early rotation, but I think there is room for misfortune with the changes, which is good to see. It's a long time since misfortune was pick ban in League of Legends. That's right. Ambition coming through the tri brush right now. He is unseen, and we do see the trades start coming through. They're going to all in, but TP started here by Samsung. There's Kube. He shows up. Ambition going to find Snowflower here, and there's a TP in response from Ixu. So TP's match, no action. Mickey out of mana in the mid lane, cast that Chaos Storm, but no finisher possible as Crown starts to heal back up with a potion. It's actually the best possible timing for a Samsung gank because Snungyun was a couple of minions away from six. If there was the six, that team fight would have definitely gone for a freak of it. The result, even despite a lot of traded resources between the top laners and junglers. Yeah, Ixu still nice follow up on the TP timing. Came in there instantly to ensure that a kill wouldn't happen. If you're playing Maokai on patch 524, you better be good at the teleports. Lintara has been good at teleports. It's true. From CJ. Made some nice plays in the laning phase. Lake of Tanks is back. Oh boy. Well, no Ex unless you're the Ku Tigers, or the Rocks Tigers, rather. Sure, there's still room for the Fioras of the world. Fiora in particular is the one carry who, of course, has a really good laning phase that develops against tanks with percentage true damage. But just the, rea the reality of AD carries being space control. Someone like Misfortune is picked for Make It Rain and Bullet Time just because there's no Infinity Edge, Phantom Dancer, Last Whisper, tank killing build. There's just no way to kill the tanks, and that's why the AD carry champion pool has moved towards more zone control and more poke damage safety rather than actually getting in there and auto attacking people to death. True enough. Okay, Kube. And tank kills. That's right. He is, Kube has been having a tougher time when it comes to CSing in lane. It's worth knowing that Kube is going a very offensive build. You know, Maokai is going to be building for lane. Kube is going the Black Cleaver that was nerfed during the patch process to be more about offensive stats, less tankiness from it. But if you can get through a laning phase and you get to build Black Cleaver, you're feeling fine if you're all up. Yeah, and really hasn't been under threat so far. So we do see the lanes returning to normal as teams start thinking about the possibility of getting that dragon. A little bit of dueling here. Kuve dueling in the minion wave, though, is going to take quite a sizable chunk of damage. And nice ward there to get the follow up from the sapling doesn't quite hit. Crown's gonna have continued lane control. You'll notice this hex core has still not been upgraded, forced into a Negatron cloak. This lane only really starts to go to Victor's favor when he has that wave clear. We spoke about it, level seven and hex core upgrade. Has the level, but hasn't had the luxury of being able to spend a thousand gold on a hex core. Okay, so far he's going to get caught, but Stitch, he's gonna try and flash out, doesn't make it, and goodbye. Lyra helps Song Yoon pick up that first kill. Flash out of the way of the cocoon, but the follow up flash from Snowflower just a little bit too much. Nice little dive. Good pathing coming through from Lyra. Misfortune was six, didn't even have to use ultimate. Instead, Ambition was playing lip service around mid lane, but the turret dive just wasn't looking likely on Victor. They'll chain that straight into a dragon, but Ambition now wants to dive Ixu in this top side. Kuve doesn't have the most mana or HP. Cut the wave there. Tried to tank it, but they're going to just simply back off, not willing to take that risk. So nice little advantage there from Africa. 
take an objective, take first blood, and nothing from Samsung in response. I know Maokai's been on the edge of the meta for a while, but you do not turret dive a fairly full health, full mana defensive build Maokai at level 8. Just wasn't going to be a high percentage play, so smart of them to back away, but the result is a bit of happy feeding from Ambition in terms of actually getting something done compared to Lyra making a very strong, decisive turret dive bottom that got them multiple objectives. Yeah. Looks like Ambition just happy to farm up this game, at least has an edge in that category. But not going to be the big playmaker. But Samsung here, they are just waiting, biding their time. They need items, they need Crown to get big. But it, when we look at these team fights, we talked about it during Champions. Oh, Wraith's going to be not hitting that flash up. Gets the flay in the end. There's a knockup from Ambition, but Crown is frozen in the gravity field. And that's going to be a lantern to save Ambition. The 1v3 gank easily dealt with by Mickey. Crown needed to either use cleanse or get away from that. Yeah, why didn't he use cleanse? It's greed, I guess. Greed of summoners has been definitely a recurring problem from Crown this particular game. Wow, that is very odd. Mickey did not have Flash available to him right there, so they could have easily mopped up that kill had Crown used his cleanse in that little engagement. Ambition was full health with a Cinderhawk. He could have tanked close to six to seven turret shots. If you confirm poison and all in, you would have got the kill, but Crown not using summons. It's a recurring story of this set. Crown has been at the top of solo queue as well, so we know he's better mechanically in terms of decision making in the lane than this. Off night for him. Sunflower will get bounced around. Lyra finds Stish on the backside. Big bullet time, but it's just on the edge, and Samsung going to kite it out. There's the Ixu coming in, though, and Maokai in the choke point with his ultimate pops for a little bit more damage. Stitch trying to kite out, doesn't get hit by the Arcane Smash. So one for one the trade. When the dust settles, Actually, Africa looking down to push now. It was a super play from Ixu. What he did was yeah. he found a target he could and instantly flash uh, Arcane smashed three people into AoE. If there had been the cooldown from Sang Yoon, he's already level seven. If he had managed to get the make it rain in that choke, it would have been a double to triple kill. So really nice play from Ixu, despite the cooldowns not really matching up. Yeah, Sang Yoon there too, not having the best ultimate, unfortunately for him because it was far too easy for the members of Samsung to kite their way out of the damage. So the result, again, another small advantage to Afrika. Even when Samsung had the better teleport ward put down, and thus the better teleport and the first reaction, still the trade looking good for Afrika. Indeed, and as you pointed out, still no upgrade on the hex score from Victor. Gets the Frost Queen's claim first. So very delayed here on Victor's actual damage, just going for the survivability against Crown. Again, it's not so much the damage, but it's the wave clear. Yeah. Every Victor player knows the moment that you get the E upgrade and can just instant clear the backline means you have so much control. It's why in this matchup, Faker will just push in, get those chip auto attacks onto the enemy turret, and then take that turret early and roam with the maneuverability you get from the second hex score upgrade. But in this, res in this play, this is Mickey basically saying, I want to farm up for late game. I'm not looking to roam. I'm not looking to leave. Uh, the mid lane, I'm just going to play as defensively minded as possible, which for Mickey is actually a big change of pace. Yeah, but in this scenario, when you have a lower range AD carry, who is reliant on getting a lot of auto attacks off in a fight, and a lower range mage on the enemy team and a melee top laner, and you're sitting there thinking, well, I have bullet time, a big tank line, and a chaos storm, that looks like a more attractive option. Kuve has to rag his way out. Rag his way out. That's right, he's ragging real hard right now. <laughs> Looking to see if Cuve might be greedy and stay top. A victim missing. Means that Cuve has the top lane sense to back away. By the way, Ragnarok is just a terrible name for that ultimate. Ragnarok is the Norse mythological end of the world. How does that get you out of these kind of situations? It doesn't make you invulnerable. It's, ah. the, it's the death of the gods. Well, let's think about it from the other perspective. How do you think Lucian felt in the previous game when <laughs> Ragnarok was popped and Olaf was running at him and there was nothing but, he could do? But all the Viking gods die. He's the Viking. What I'm trying to tell you is that thematically, <laughs> it is named around Olaf running in, not running away. Yeah, but the Vikings die in Ragnarok. Also, Ragnarok is used defensively a lot more than it's used <laughs> offensively, let's be real. <laughs> Buff the rest of his kit and make him only immune to CC when he's running at an enemy champion. There you go. Boom. Thematically oh, that, approved. 
No, it's still not thematically approved because the Vikings Gee. the Vikings can't be invulnerable in that particular situation, right? To really just cause him to die faster. He usually does. On my own. <laughs> Swifty boots picked up all over the place. League of Swifties. So exciting. I remember when those boots were assigned someone was trolling. While well, playing Udia. <laughs> yes, Udia was the... Oh, and Garen. That's true. Garen, Udia only boots. <laughs> now they're really good. Hard to argue with them. You get great value for the price. Do you build Frost Queen's claim on Cassiopeia? That's the question Crown has to answer. Hasn't started it yet, but just given the efficiency of the item, even if you pick it up late, okay, you generate less gold, but you're still picking up incidental gold as you move along. Yeah, I'm very curious what his plan is around his itemization, considering we are going to be seeing that first Cassiopeia of the season. Tia's not really optional, and Mickey does enough trade damage on Victor with Burst, that you kind of need the Abyssal given your damage ranges. Cassiopeia is almost always in range of Abyssal Scepter just because all her damage is done at 6, 650 range. So it's, those are kind of core items. I could understand going from here into Boss Queens or maybe just leaving it as finally Mickey upgraded that hex goal. Oh boy. He's got it now. Clear those waves. Spooky ghosts. Got the ghosts, got his boots of swiftness, and now decides to start stacking up that Core item for Victor. No one's in a mobile mage with Swifties and Frost Queen's claim. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, he was pretty deftly sidestepping three-man turret dives, so almost seems like redundant at this point. Are we gonna see a play? There are a lot of members in that brush. Snowflower going to be coming through. Cool. He's gonna flash and ult, but not going to get the play. Meanwhile, Ambition trying to clean up Mickey. There's a teleport from Samsung. That'll be Kube showing up for a party that uh, is not going to be happening because it's already over. And no dragon right now, at least. Top of the kill onto Mickey, who burned both of his summoners. It was off screen. We have to expect that he took a direct route to bottom lane and was caught by Ambition. And now the mid turret going to fall in Samsung's favor first in this game. And they'll even up the turret score and even up the gold total. With that objective, now they can transition possibly into a dragon, but Mickey up in five means it's probably not going to be happening with Misfortune still sitting around that blue buff. Let's try and take it though. Full time is available. Full time's available. Mickey's not there. Not level 11 is Misfortune yet either. And with no Mickey, falling low. It looks like with Ren, they will be able to finish this one off. Kuve buying enough time. Crown is going to get hit by a Maokai W, but the Dragon is secure before Mickey can get there, and they will back off, make it rain. That's not gonna do very much there, Song Yoon. That was peculiar. Only way we could put for the channeling of the ultimate in that particular scenario. Yeah, another objective goes through. It tells you how strong Swiftness boots are, that when you have to think that uh, CDR boots were buffed extensive as we finally see Mickey Oh, gets the slow off. It's the slow off. A lot of damage coming through from Crown and Ambition commits the t to the flash, and that's enough to pick up the kill on Mickey. Evens up that kill score, evens up the gold score, evens up the dragon score. We're dead even in this game, Papa Smithy. Dead even in the game. Not the set, of course. Samsung did pick up game one and a come from behind victory. Now we can do some farming. I love farming. Well, you've seen a lot of it this week. Seraph's embrace the next item done under Crown as he has that tier fully stacked by 19 minutes. Pretty quick stacking from this Cassiopeia. There's Quadra Swifties and Moba and uh, Moby Boots on Afrika's side. That's fun. But I was just making the point that you know, CDR boots felt core to mid lane as not a couple of weeks ago, given the fact that you now get 10% summoner cooldown reduction. You're going for Frost Queen's claim, so it's harder to get to 40% CDR. It shows you how strong Swiftness boots are, and I guess the prevalence of things like Frost Queen's claim that Swiftness boots have gone up this many tiers this quickly in terms of priority of buy. Well, especially Samsung has very low amounts of hard CC outside of a Cassiopeia Alton. So the Swiftest boots with all the slows going to be doing quite a bit of work, especially if you can turn your back on that Cassie ult, reducing that by 
At one point, I actually haven't heard mentioned about specifically Merc Treads leaving the meadows that people point to the oh! Oh, ambition with the blind steal. Yeah, Brace Seeker steal right there. Shoots his Q over the wall and picks up a blue buff. He'll be happy to have that. Keep it away. Limit the wave clear options that Mickey has. Now the pink ward brush gank. Going to be an option. Sangyun just going to E that brush. Very much afraid of walking into lane with so many MIA. Iksu now taking some true damage through his ultimate. Lyra there just as a reserve, and everyone just heads back to lane and ambition back to base. Gank not going to work out. Nice conservative play from the Freaks bottom lane duo. People think Mercs too expensive to pick up. They are 800 gold, but I think the big thing to me that people sleep on is that the 20 tenacity you now get from Merc Treads is so close to being unnoticeable in effect. That's only a 20% reduction compared to the old 35%. No one's going deep into the defensive tree, so 20% doesn't feel like it's worth the 800 gold recipe cost that it costs to pick up the Merc Treads, and that's why Swiftness Boots giving 25% slow resistance and the offensive uses and defensive uses you can have of the flat movement speed feels like they kind of fill the role of Merc Treads at a much cheaper price point. Yeah. Well, Stitch heads back. We do see Kuve finally chipping away at that tower to get number two in this game for Samsung. And it's been it's been a bit of a slow affair compared to last game where had a lot of those kills early. Definitely more methodical this time, but Samsung does have that vision advantage. You can see the deep wards heading into the jungle on both sides, thanks to that mid turret being down. I mean, Samsung's in a very similar position on the blue side that Afrika was in the last game. They got that mid turret down, they pushed up their vision well. The next objective, with things like Baron not really able to be picked up right now and Dragon off the menu, is those enemy buffs. You should be contesting enemy red and enemy blue buff with the amount of control you have, both in terms of vision and just the item pickups you have. You're ahead in gold, you're ahead in momentum. It should be Samsung trying to capitalize on that, pushing up their waves, and specifically contesting these big buffs on the side of a freak. Well, it's also the minion wave denial. We see Kuve right now walking into the enemy jungle to chase off Maokai because he knows he's perfectly safe. So why not just go back, try and farm these minion waves, deny as many as you can from your opponent, and set up for the next dragon. We see Maokai heading back into lane right now. And Crown pushing, and it looks like Samsung just going to push across the board to maximize their chance of getting this next dragon. Can they smartly evade bullet time? That's the question for Samsung. It's level 12 now, not quite the Infinity Edge completed, but still a lot of flat AD available, and level 2 ultimate coming from Sung Yoon. Sung Yoon's last ult wasn't the best, so going to need to be smarter about positioning this next fight. You know what else makes me mad about it, uh, ultimate names in this game? Bullet time was used and developed in the Matrix to show people dodging bullets, right? But instead, bullet time is actually an undodgeable ultimate from Misfortune. And honestly, if anyone's doing a Matrix reference, it's Lucian, of course, with his ultimate. <laughs> so... <laughs> Strange. Damn it, Papa Smithy. Why does Riot name ultimates the exact opposite of the thing that they do? I mean, naming's not their strong point. They still name Shen a ninja, which, yes. I don't know about that either. I, I can't believe they reworked Shen. I know. He's I, it's still <laughs> a crappy, the world's worst ninja. They still classified a ninja. At this point, they're doing it just to smite you and don't. Well, I, I don't think I'm being smote here, but... Annoyed, at minimum. <laughs> Perturbed. Spited, perhaps. Definitely spited. <laughs> oh. Well, they're going to grab Snowflower. Snowflower has to flash ult to get out of that. Meanwhile, there's a TP. Kuve going to show up and instantly Ragnarok to save Stitch. Iksu was in that front line. He's going to have to get Lanterned out to survive. Sounds Bit of an odd engagement. Iksu once again breaking up the fight with his TP. He has been on point this game. If Samsung can force multiple skirmishes, they are so much more incentivized than trying to run straight into bullet time. So they're going to keep sniffing for an engage, a pick, because, as I said, running into the five members of a freak is going to be a very painful day for Samsung. They keep about 50% health, and Crown's still on the other side, so they're forcing Africa to pick up this minion wave 
They're going to try and actually pick up the wave with Mickey and do the dragon at the same time, and that's going to be an ambition. It's knocked up with a pulverize as he tries to engage. Crown is here, though, just shredding Ixu. Bullet time over the wall. It hits ambition, but no one else. Now that crucial ultimate is off the table. It will hit Crown. Crown actually weirdly using his cleanse right there, despite no one even close to follow up. We knew it was unnecessary. He didn't have vision of people in that brush, so he thought better safe than sorry, which is actually a pretty big thing for Crown. That's an adaptation. That's true. Well, Ambition gets some additional damage on Lyra. Now the blue buff contest is underway. Ghost popped, and Ambition finds himself with another blue. Second blue steal in a row from Ambition. Yeah, this time with the help of Smite, and look how much minion Gold is being denied as they go into these turrets. Samsung successfully stalling, pushing waves, taking a turret, and they're going to take the Dragon too. So Samsung coming out the big winner there despite a bit of a sloppy start to that fight. And a nice port from Ixu to save his team. They take the turret, they can kite back and take this Dragon. Crucially, Ixu doesn't have teleport, and has obviously shown himself on the top side of the map. Anarchy give up any hopes of contesting this Dragon. They have one of their own, so of course, second Dragon. Not the biggest give up when you're approaching from Afrika's side, but Afrika's going to have to start forcing things soon. Then we're going to talk about those range issues where they want to be kiting back, but if you're forcing, that means Maokai's going to be very separated from his threats. Yeah, and the next step for Samsung here is to use this mid-wave to push forward, get wards around this Baron, and start pressuring that because Callista and Olaf and Cassiopeia can do that Baron really fast. That Baron Secure is excellent. Cassiopeia was always one of those champions who, when in meta, you had to respect 20 to 22 minute Barons, even when they were out of vogue. Just because you give her a blue buff, she's going to keep poison up, and basically no cooldown on the Twin Fangs means those objectives go down fast. They do. Anarchy now setting up, trying to take a mid turret of their own, but they don't even succeed in getting that much damage. Uve on the split push, and they have to push out the top side now to make this work, but Samsung, they don't have the best wave clear. They do have Hurricane now for Stitch, who's again building a Hex Drinker, and he's going after that Maw one more time. Yeah, not sure if we'll see him invest further into the Sterics Gate, but certainly that possibility. You mentioned that wave clear. Freak is not confident enough. They don't have the vision. They don't feel safe enough to go for the chip damage that, honestly, they could easily be doing. Well, they were worried about a flank coming through from Olaf, who is running around in their bottom side jungle and threatening the back line. Kuve still here, wards cleared out by Africa, however, at least toward down towards the river, still plenty of wards for Samsung as we see that Maokai go into lane. But now it, it's all about the vision game around the Baron. That should be the first and primary goal of Samsung. They need to continuously threaten that objective and try and force Africa to waste ults to defend it. Wasting ults, wasting a teleport, specifically a global from Ixu would be a big boon. There's actually only been four kills in 28 minutes. It's been a very low kill game, and that suits Samsung because it's all about team fighting and kiting backwards on Afrika's side. And so far, Samsung haven't had to deal with any team fight wombo from the side of Afrika. No, they've gotten a healthy turret and gold lead just as a result of playing better around these minion waves. Here we go. This is where the deep vision begins to come through. Vicky dealing a lot of damage to Ambition, who has picked up that quick spirit visage. I mentioned in the previous game that Afrika, when they were around this level, maybe slightly less ahead than Samsung is this game. They didn't have many pinks down. Look at the pink ward line down from Samsung. Both sides of the mid lane pink warded, a pink ward controlling the Baron area, and even forcing one up as far as the enemy red buff. You talked about getting Baron vision. Given the nature of the vision game, specifically on 524 before the yellow trinket changes come on 6.1, you couldn't ask for anything more from Samsung. It's just can they capitalize on what they've set up? Yes, but they may lose quite a few wards right here. They saw the recall from Wraith with the spooky ghosts, and now they're going to lose a couple pinks as they get pushed forward. So everyone recalling at the same time, not doing them very many favors. There's four in the infantry, though, so keeping those pink ward slots open. Two on the side of Afrika, but though theirs are being cleared a lot quicker, obviously, with their lack of pressure. So back to a holding pattern here as Samsung seeks to keep the remaining two outer turrets. 
and move around that. But they, they've got to keep pushing here, and they have to keep threatening that Baron. They're not actually being very convincing that they could or would do a Baron at the moment, and they're certainly not fa forcing any dangerous face checks, but there's Snowflower TP going to be coming in from Ixu, and there's the Olaf ulting into the back line immediately. He's trying to get there, and Sangyu going to open up with the bullet time, but everyone just kites out of it. Kube taking the most damage so far alongside Snowflower, but another inconclusive fight. It's just smart from Samson. They need to back away the moment the ult's channel, but it's down now. It is, and so they're going in for some more poke damage as they try and get in front of the minion wave and preserve their mid lane turret. Here we go, Ambition gets the knock up onto Ixu. Snowflower doesn't have the ult, it's Crown now gonna come and chase him down. Lyra, the next target, two kills for Crown and one for Stitch, and that should be a Baron. Samsung bought enough time, never overcommitted, didn't use their all-important teamfight ultimates, and then pulled the trigger, and this should be Baron as a result. Every time we see that bullet time down, it actually is living up to its name because Samsung just dodges straight through it, and it hasn't been able to be used effectively here. They wait for the cooldown and then turn it. So we watch this fight again, and it's all about the bullet time, when it's up and when it's down. At this point in the fight, it's already down, and that's why Crown suddenly realizes that he can be so much more aggressive in his positioning. It is the Lissandra damage. It's a real big factor here. Well, just good, a very good spread. There wasn't a good opportunity to use the gravity field or the chaos storm because they were split up in the river and in front of the turret. So that was a pretty ideal situation. Samsung positioned against the AoE and kind of maximizing spreading Africa out so they could use the single target damage from this Cassiopeia. You just you kind of need a history lesson on Misfortune's last time in the meta, Curse the Sad Bullet Time was a big factor for a time in Korea. Other, other teams in, in other nations tried to copy it to very mixed success, and even in terms of Korea, the binary nature of Curse the Sad Bullet Time eventually led to it being forced out of the meta for other reasons as well. It's why people were not sure how big a factor Misfortune would be at the top level competitive play, because it feels like her big strength on this patch is the lane control into what is good team find that can be worked around. When the lane control is taken out and it's only the ult that you're bringing Misfortune for, that's when she really seems to fall completely out of the meta. Yeah, and also just the prevalence of Boots of Swiftness too, because you can get out of the bullet time relatively rapidly or dodge it in the first place, considering the base movement speed is uh, higher than normal on this patch. Uh, that does create even more significant issues. And now with this Baron buff, they've taken one turret off of the Kuve split. And they're looking for another one. They have a pretty poor sieging composition, though. So they'll have to land a hook first. Uh, even then, Stitch works his way through the mid lane tier two. Now they start pinging that red buff and moving up for a steal. Kuve racing out of the base, has finished his Sterex gauge. And Stitch is working on one of his own. Uh, starting to use some elixirs too, Kuve. And she has the most offensive of the elixir choices, so he's looking to do damage himself, rush down Samyun, stop the channel if she's forced to cancel the channel to get away from Olaf. Mission success from the Olaf player's perspective. She feels like so many answers and honestly really, really smart team fighter. Whether it's grouping their threats into multiple skirmishes, Whoops, Mission stopped a little short there of the knockup by a away, cocoon. Or backing away from bullet time. It's been really smartly played by Samsung. Yeah, big credit to them for allowing this misfortune through and then playing so well against it. So here we go, just slowly working away. Stitch there, a bit of a shield from the Lantern. Crown making his appearance in the top side. But still looking to see if he can get a catch or some damage as Victor He's attempting to clear out these waves from mid. More poke damage coming. Crown has to be so much more on the ball about his position. Doesn't have flash for this fight. Still has cleanse available, though. If he had flash, he might have even thought about a turret dive flank with the ultimate. But no such luxury when flash is down. And that was about perfect timing. Really nice siege. They get the turret and the Baron buff. Going to expire very soon, so get back to base and then start to work on cracking the remaining inhibitor turrets. Three still up for Africa. 
And it may be a while. This game, certainly Samsung has a large advantage, but they don't have a great way to siege without Baron. So we may have to wait for another one of those for this to actually be closed unless Africa takes another bad team fight. It's insane that five men running through mid are still not able to pick up the outer mid lane turret at 35 minutes. It's why we paid so much lip service to the importance of first Afrika picking up an early mid, la mid lane turret last game and Samsung picking up one up this game because the control it's given and the difficulty with which it takes to take down those outer mid lane turret has forced so many ARAM wars this week. Yeah. And it's even extra surprising because Samsung doesn't have a great wave clear champion to stop Africa's pushing, but they've just had this advantage, and especially in terms of vision that has made pushing very dangerous for the Freaks over the course of this game. I have to wonder how situational this Callista build will become. I was thinking about viable AD carries, and I was thinking mainly about the casters, the likes of Lucian, Corky, Ezreal, and Misfortune. More caster-based AD carries just because we talked about it. Hard to kill tanks with right-click auto attacks. Of course, Callista is an auto attack champion. It's just this item build. It's a very different build. It's all about getting in aggressive with your positioning because you've invested so much in things that keep you alive during a fight to eventually do damage rather than cutting people down with sheer attack speed, attack damage, critical strike, and armor penetration like previous maps. Yes. Now, well, Kuve still the big split push threat here. And definitely running those minion waves into the turrets, but. We're in for a little bit of a long one. Samsung is content just to play for the next Baron. They already have a ton of pink wards blacking out the jungle of Africa, and Ambition is very assiduously defending them right now, but so far, we find an angle onto one. And this is definitely not Samsung being shy to pull the trigger. This is a reality of their comp. They yep. do not have any semblance of a siege comp, and as you mentioned, if this game had gone differently, they have no real wave clear of their own, barring Hurricane Callista having her way with a minion wave, which require her to get pretty aggressively into the minion wave position for a sort of pick. So Samsung realized that they basically put together this scenario where 37 minutes in, they are in a wonderful spot given their comp. It's just one mistake comes through, 38, 40 minutes in, 60 second death timers, two team fights, and Afrika could win this game. Yeah. And they're in a position, too, where their win condition is barren, and they're against a team that does a hell of a lot of AoE damage and has good zoning potential. So getting caught in the pit here, even with a massive 10k deficit, Africa can still make this competitive with the right positioning. Samsung, go and watch the VOD. I guess the only thing that, that really let them down in the early game, because they did so much right, they should take so much from the smart decisions they made, losing that one dragon. If they had had four dragons at this point, suddenly there'd be a six minute timer on this game. But given that it's only gonna be the fourth dragon they should pick up fairly uncontestedly in a minute and a half, or depending on when they go and fight for this Baron, if they had the, that extra dragon stack, it would be much easier to put this game in the bank. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It'd be a major factor, even though it would still be pretty late, fifth sure. dragon. We haven't seen a lot of emphasis in the early game around that right now, and Ambition just, Dodging left, dodging right, not going to be hit by anything from Lyra. And now they set their sights. Baron has spawned. Kuve is here for impossible teleport flank. Emergency recall from Crown. Grabbing some more items. He does hit a six item build after that, and he has a ton of AP, no doubt. Almost six items, Mickey, but of course, slightly lower cost. Uh -oh. Ambition. That's a huge play. He gets frozen in midair, and he doesn't quite die. That is absolutely massive. Meanwhile, Kuve has to get in into the back line, going to pop his Sterix, but no more Ragnarok. And wow, that was so very close. The Chain CC just a little bit mistimed. And if they had bought themselves a second or two more, maybe that would have been a kill and a turnaround in this game. It's a trademark CJ Ambition brain explosion where he just didn't respect CC ranges, almost gave up his life as a result. Cuve tried to dive in to basically divert attention and then had to run away. So they misuse cooldowns, misuse flashes, purely from greed from the side of Ambition. Yeah, fortunately, for Samsung, Ixu was also using his TP there, so it's not as bad as it could have been. And they're going to turn onto the Dragon instead after it spawned, but that will delay this game and may cost them quite a few wards. 
around that Baron, but it, it's not being swept very aggressively right now by Africa. Just surprising to see after 39 minutes of controlled League of Legends playing around multiple different enemy win conditions. One mistake at 39 minutes. Hasn't cost them just yet, but might serve as a preview for what could be a potential heist of a, wi a victory for Afrika. Yeah, a Ambition now, he's going to be the designated split pusher because of his ultimate, but he doesn't have any damage on this Rek'Sai outside of his Q in a Cinder Hulk. Meanwhile, Kube is nowhere to be found, and this is a rush off the Baron by Afrika. Their top laner is not there. There's the Rek'Sai ult. Africa wants to fight this gravity field down. Ambition gonna find his way in the pit, get a knock up and then get right out. Meanwhile, Crown gonna try and make this work. Sogyun in the back line has to flash and cancel his bullet time. Mickey is going to kill Wraith though to start off this fight. Crown still trying to get some damage down on the back. He's gonna get Ixu, but that is going to be it. And Crown will be targeted himself, has to use the Zonia's Hourglass and he will fall four for one. Kuve just not there and not in position. So Africa, buys themselves just a little bit more time. They're not gonna be able to do the Baron with their health bars flashing. And I don't even know if they're going to be able to get a turret in the end with Ambition still pushing this out. They still get a lot of gold and specifically experience just because they've been denied pretty well in this early game. They were 10,000 gold behind at the start of that fight, but summoner spells being down, the vision game being down after so much control. Both their control of vision and the summoners being down mean that Ambition couldn't reposition himself with a flash after he tunneled down. Meant that Afrika could kite back and we finally saw bullet time and a six item Victor standing in the bullet time getting free damage because no one could close him down. And this is a major problem now that the Baron is actually going to be taken by Africa while we're still waiting for the members of Samsung to spawn. This is where the lack of wave clear from Samsung is going to be highly problematic. They should lose a whole heap of towers for this. Yeah, Afrika against the Baron. We're going to see a replay come through. Remember the summoner spells being down at this point. The bullet time happens. And you can see that the positioning here for Afrika can be that much more aggressive because they don't have to respect things. Cuve does a lot of damage. He's relatively tanky. But focus fire from Victor and Misfortune is a big deal at this point in the game. Yeah, and fighting just on that single front is exactly how Africa wants to go about this. You mentioned the kiting, and when they have priority on the Baron, they can kite to their heart's content. And if you don't have a more immediate threat on the back line, which they didn't because Kube's port was down, and because he was just basically running straight from the base in a direct line to the Baron pit. Spells disaster for Samsung, even with that very hefty gold lead. And that gold lead's about to be cut down pretty significantly. I mean, we mentioned it during picks and bans. The moment that they committed to Thresh and this lineup against Misfortune with Misfortune up, their backline threat is almost minimal. And Cuvee alone is not enough because he will be shredded by multiple members of Afrika. There's the first turret for the Baron power play of Afrika. Only their second of the game, but it's not going to be the last one to fall. They miss a hook and they start to put down just a little bit of damage right here. Have to be careful when sieging with Misfortune due to her lack of movement. If she gets crowd controlled, obviously a huge problem. Stitch actually backed in vision. That could, was a small window for a turret dive now when that back, minion came back. through. But he's back by now, but backing in vision just as that minion wave came into the end of turret could have been a potential go button. The siege will not stop though. Oh, wow, here we go. Mickey trying to poke out right now. Gravity field used, but Sangyun is very afraid of actually being in range to auto this turret, so they only get about a sixth of the damage down. And if this is how this Baron is going to be used by Africa, I guess Samsung really has nothing to worry about. Sangyun has no flash, and you can see the Stitch and Crown both do. Crown just getting the flash back, so Sangyun has to play so defensively. Mickey's auto attacks aren't doing enough, so as you mentioned, more of a stalemate than we expected. That's why it's smart to see Lyra rotating. Might only be in the least, but still. Wow. That's Huge damage. Huge damage from Crown. And that's with Eye of the Equinox and a Locket. Yeah, wow. Well, that's what you get with a late game Cassiopeia, no doubt. Love to see her stacks right now, actually. She must have max stacks at yeah. this point with 442 CS. There's no world where she doesn't have that 30% extra AP from passive. Absolutely massive. Well, next time we click on her, we can check out and see what her AP is in this game. Take a guess. I'm thinking about 1,100. I think that's probably accurate. Damn. That's a lot. No yeah. Medjai's. Still We're going to play prices AP. right on this if you go What's over. What's the line? What's the line? <laughs> the line's 1,000. Over on Monte Cristo.
I'm saying over. I agree with you. Over without even... Here we oh. go. Oh, I didn't catch it. I didn't catch it either. We both Damn fail. <laughs> Don't click on Cassiopeia again. There's my prediction. Okay, another setup here at the Dragon. This would be number five, so Samsung still has ways to win this game here at 45 minutes. Does Ixu have teleport wards? I see one in red buff. The other ones aren't quite as aggressive when it comes to fighting without home guards. Still going to be moving this way. Baron buff off Africa now. We won't have that little bit of help when it comes to fighting around this next dragon. 18 seconds. Africa trying to push that wave enough and ghosts deter any kind of engagement, but Samsung, they are nice and spread out right now in the mid lane, so no good engagement opportunities from Africa. They just want to control this and force a trade if possible, but they have to fight around this dragon. Africa really want to fight in a corridor where bullet time can do work, flash or no flash, it'll be difficult to get away if fighting in a fairly narrow corridor, very rumble-esque in that way. Putting on pressure, they cannot give up a fifth drag. Uh, Crown has to use the, uh oh, he gets knocked down after using his cleanse early. He's gonna have to deal with this situation and Mickey's gonna get the first kill of the fight. Stitch all alone trying to hop his way to victory, but it's just not gonna be, oh, does survive with the Sterix gauge actually. And he's trying to just get out of the backside of the enemy jungle, but he gets hit for a fat crit. You from can, Song Yoon. This is the reality of Cassiopeia. It's so hard to position because two tanks diving her. She doesn't have the damage to take down this Maokai with Spirit Visage, with all the health stacking, even a second Spectre's Cow. And Crown did no damage in that fight. Well, Crown was caught by a cocoon, had to use his cleanse early. And Juve's fighting around the Cassiopeia because Cassiopeia is probably the true hypercarry in this case. It's a fairly tanky Callista. On the other side of the fight, though, Mickey's burst meant that one member died instantly and Callista was only kiting and buying time to an inevitable death. Yeah, did nearly take out Mickey in the end, but after that last crit, Mickey intelligently backing off and allowing Song Yoon to play janitor and clean up the Callista. I just don't think you can have your Olaf fighting around your Cassiopeia. It's not a champion with any semblance of peel. Olaf's all about diving the misfortune, a fairly immobile AD carry. And if you're playing around the Cassiopeia, we need all the threads grouped or none of them. That's kind of the reality for Samsung. So Africa inevitably perhaps closing that gold gap with their composition in this late game. They deny a possible fifth dragon. They took the last Baron. Baron up again in a minute. They had a very successful fight, but TP back up now for Kube, so maybe he can do the damage he needs to do against Song Yun. What's next for Africa? It's all been about them breaking the base, you know, back when we used to see the Jugger more days, we always say, okay, the acid test is, can you break the base before a certain point? They've been hitting every timing, barring breaking the base or taking Baron. That's been the reality of Afrika in previous games. So it's all about whether they can take what well, they've been afforded, which is what, about 15,000 gold worth of catching up and actually find a win condition. Because for now, it feels like every six minutes they have to fight on Samsung's terms around Dragon. Yeah, interestingly, Callista has gone for much more of a lifesteal build than we typically see. It's all about that sustained damage and survivability in well, these team fights for Stitch. Last Whisper's not a not an item you build anymore, really. You can see because Misfortune's so alt-centric, she's got the Lord. Last Whisper there. Because Misfortune's alt at this point is doing around four, four and a half thousand damage, but no way to fit that in if you're Stitch. Same effective build. You've still got more Malmordius. You've still got Sterix Gauge. It's still about staying alive. It needs to be staying alive next to a Cassiopeia. That's what I want to see for the next fight for Samson. All right. Africa wants to go for this Baron again. Kuve not positioned particularly well. And this Baron may just die before anyone has a chance to get there. They get the ward in, but it's going to be too late. The fight has started, but the Baron is done. Snowflower nearly dead. Ixu taking a bunch of damage on the front line. Crown exhausted, trying to kite out the back of this fight. Bullet time going to do nothing. And Wraith comes in with an interrupt. Can Crown clean up this fight? Stitch is there. He's still alive. Two members of Africa now down. Mickey low. They're going to be on the run. Double kill for Kuve. But man, Wraith managed to sneak in there and interrupt the bullet time with a flay of all things. Didn't even have to flash. And in general, that was just because Africa was splitting their call. Cuvee's getting cute though. Yeah, he is. He's not going to fall. Has to back off. Stitch in the meantime, 
on a mission here in the mid lane. Kube is just there to deny these recalls, and even with a Baron empowered recall, they can't quite do it. Crown will fall, but so will Song Yoon, and Ambition is back. And Mickey is in his sights. He's trying to run. There's the gravity field. Boom, dunked with the true damage. And that's going to be it. Samsung, in the end, will get the ace around the Baron. And fortunately for Africa, they split up. They had a split call finishing the Baron while fighting at the same time. And that bought Samsung just enough of a window to take the fight and to take the 2-0 win. This game seesawed on two split calls. One of them was a team fight where Cassiopeia and Olaf fought on one side and Afrika cleaned it up and closed the gap. In the second time, they stayed on Baron with three. Two tanks dived the back line, but it was 2v5. They fought. There was no inkling for Samsung to look for the steal. They just killed the tanks in the front line and suddenly, even with Baron buff, 5v3 at 50 minutes in the game, you will lose that if you're Africa. Well, with, by the time the turn happened, Snowflower was at a quarter HP, Ixu was at 50%, and then there's nothing else you can do. The bullet time again uh, tried to get set up, but I, I actually just can't even believe that Wraith managed to get into the back line without a flash and just free flay the misfortune. There was just no peel. Just an insane last fight. If Afrika had a clear call of all five members collapsing or all five members staying on the Baron, because ironically what happened was Callista and Cassiopeia finally got a fight where they could fight together just because there weren't five members to discern and deal and split their threats between. Yeah. Well, a tough loss for Africa. Couple very, very close games. We saw the big comeback in game number one from Samsung and Africa nearly repeating that huge comeback in game number two. Samsung finds the fight around the bear. You can see Africa looking a bit frustrated after that series. Wasn't that's, a, that's a hard series to lose, yeah, honestly. There, there wasn't any sign of the tilt you kind of suggested there might be, but the result of words like nearly is nearly doesn't get you a lot of points. Samsung have nearly lost a couple of their games, but the reality is they're two and up. Yeah, they are. A big game from Crown, too, on that Cassiopeia. A lot of question marks as to whether Samsung would be able to successfully team fight with the zone control from Africa, but they made it work. They made it out old to key times and got the win. So Samsung now moves to 2-0 and on the season. They haven't faced any of the kind of big four teams in Korea yet, but looking good, have yet to drop the game.